My name is Nolutando Nematswerani. I'd like to welcome those who are joining us for the first time and welcome back our usual participants to tonight's webinar. This forms part of an important conversation about driving vaccine uptake in our population. So tonight's topic is really around COVID's real world vaccine effectiveness and safety insights that Discovery um, uh, colleagues are going to be sharing with you tonight. Just a reminder with all our webinars, they are CPD accredited. Certificates take about a week to be ready. So if you've got any queries regarding this, please send them to cpd at discovery.co.za. All webinars are made available on the Discovery website under the tab for healthcare workers. Please ask questions uh, using our Q&A button, not the chat button. And do understand that sometimes we are inundated with uh, vol high volumes of um, questions. And therefore we'll try and theme them as best as we can so that we allow our presenters uh, to, to answer as many of them as possible. At the end of the, of the talk or of the webinar, we will have a poll. Uh, please uh, participate in this and give us the feedback. It helps us to improve on our you know, delivery of the webinars, but it also provides a feedback for our speakers. So tonight's webinar will be led by two colleagues of mine from Discovery, Dr. Ronald Willen and uh, Mrs. Uh, Shelley Colley. So Dr. Ronald Willen is not new to, to this platform. He has been here before. Um, Ron has extensive experience in clinical and corporate healthcare spanning more than 20 years and 25 uh, countries globally. He's currently the Chief Commercial Officer of Discovery Health. Joined by Shelley Colley, who's the Chief Health, uh, Health Analytics Actuary at Discovery Health and currently heads the analytical, in, the analytical intelligence area at Discovery Health. She has recently led a collaboration on behalf of Discovery with the South African Medical Research Council and the Sisonke Research Team to evaluate real world effectiveness, effectiveness of the J&J vaccine. So I'd like to really welcome uh, Ron to share the presentation followed by Shelley. And then at the end of uh, the presentations we'll uh, take the Q&A. So over to you, Ron. Many thanks for the kind introduction, Nalu. Uh, great to be with you this evening. Uh, good evening, colleagues and friends. Um, we're uh, delighted to join you on the webinar this evening. Um, and, and even more delighted to share with you the results of our real world study on uh, Pfizer vaccine effectiveness. I think this is a very unique study in that uh, it's the you know, certainly the biggest study and the first study exclusively focused on Pfizer in the context of a Delta variant outbreak in, in South Africa. It's a big uh, piece of work, uh, 1.2 million members in the data set, as well as our 1.7 million uh, data points. So I think uh, you should find the the insights here, both um, meaningful and, uh, and interesting, hopefully. Um, I'll start the, uh, the presentation. We wanted to share with you just some high level uh, facts and numbers from our discovery experience in relation to COVID so far. And then uh, Shirley will take you through the uh, outcomes from the uh, real world effectiveness uh, study. So let's uh, jump in, uh, Lorato, if you wouldn't mind. I think yeah, the first thing we wanted to do was just update you on Discovery Health's experience in relation to COVID thus far. So as you'll notice from this slide, we've uh, conducted just short of 2.5 million PCR tests to date. Uh, a huge number of PCR tests over the last uh, 18 months in relation to COVID, obviously at a huge expense as well. Out of those, we've seen 437,000 positive uh, cases across uh, Discovery Health. We've got, currently got 2,400 active cases across the, the membership base. Importantly, we've seen 11,600 um, repeat infections. Um, so we measure a repeat positive as anyone who's had a, a positive test more than 90 days apart. So quite a high uh, proportion of uh, repeat positives, 2.65% of just uh, one, one page back, thank you. Um, uh, and interestingly, across that number, we've actually had uh, uh, 15 members uh, test positive three times. Uh, once in wave one, once in wave two, and once in wave three. So I think it just, just indicates to you that reinfection certainly does happen across the different waves and across the different uh, variants. We had over 60,000 members admitted to hospital, um, and then you know, very sadly over 14,000 deaths to date across uh, the membership base. So I mean, this in many respects have been you know, catastrophic, uh, not only for South Africa, but also across uh, the discovery base. 
and then 2.5 million vaccinations administered across Discovery members to date. That's about 60% 60, uh, 60 of Discovery adult members uh, vaccinated to date. Next page, please. Also wanted to share with you, we've been tracking the South African Medical Research Council data on excess deaths very closely. As you'll see from this page, the bottom part of the page, all of the line charts there, or the bar charts there are excess deaths, uh, so deaths that are above the long-term uh, average. And what you'll notice uh, in this chart, if you look at the yellow bubbles, you'll see that in wave one, South Africa saw 1.5 times as many deaths in comparison to the long-term average. In wave two, we saw 1.9 times as many deaths uh, in comparison to the long-term average. And in wave three, 1.6 times as many uh, deaths as a, uh, in, in comparison to the long-term average. When you average out the excess deaths, South Africa has seen 41% more deaths in the last 18 months than it would have seen in a comparable period previously. Uh, effectively, what that means is the mortality rate in South Africa has gone up by 41% as a result of COVID. And that's you know, really affected you know, all of us, families, friends, communities, and then our, our patient base. So in aggregate, South Africa has seen over 260,000 excess deaths um, over the last 18 months. I mean, it really, in many respects, has been a public health a tragedy and a, and a warlike scenario, if you will. Next page. We've done extensive modeling on the uh, waves that we've already passed through. We've also done actuarial projections um, looking forward uh, to, towards a, a potential fourth wave. So this is a chart that illustrates uh, wave one, which we've labeled the original wave. Uh, the Wuhan variant was you know, predominantly uh, responsible for that wave. Wave two, which was you know, obviously caused by the beta variant and now wave three caused by the delta variant. We've, uh, I think, optimistically labeled uh, wave four as the exit wave. We're hoping that this is going to be the, the last wave, but then, then again, if anything is possible in the world of COVID, as we've all come to realize. Um, the harsh reality around this is we will likely see a wave four. I think uh, that is um, almost a fate to complete. We're, uh, you know, we're, and I think our, our actual projections are uh, corroborated by various other actual projections in, in South Africa. The only question around a wave uh, four is the magnitude of wave four. And wave four magnitude will really be de determined by a few things. One, will we see a, a different variant come into place? So there's obviously some concern around the AY 4.2 variant. Two, what will the social behaviors look like over the coming months? We know that the matric uh, festivals last year resulted in the super spreading events and really culminated in our wave two. And three, you know, a big topic for today's conversation is the level of vaccination coverage. Our actuaries project that if we're able to get 60% of South Africa, uh, South African adults vaccinated by December, there's an opportunity to save 25,000 lives. Um, and I think that really is the uh, goal of the vaccination program in the short term is 60% of the population vaccinated, 25,000 lives saved. When you think about 25,000 lives saved, that's equivalent to um, eight times as many people who have died in the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks in New York. I mean, just yeah, think about that for a second. About 3,000 people died in the terrorist attack. We got an opportunity in the palm of our hands to save 25,000 lives over the next um, you know, uh, month or so if we're able to up uh, vaccination rates. Next page. Um, South Africa is sitting in an interesting position in terms of the vaccination program at the moment. So as you'll see on the left-hand side of the slide, we've got more than sufficient uh, vaccine stock available in South Africa. So we've got uh, over 35 million, access to over 35 million doses of Pfizer vaccine. We've got access to over 33 million doses of J&J &J, uh, va vaccine. Now, cumulatively, that's more than enough stock to vaccinate the adult population and a good cross-section of the 12 to 17 population. In fact, you know, I was looking at some projections yesterday, we've got enough stock to get through booster doses as well. So stock uh, supply of vaccine is not, not a challenge. The challenge we're facing with is, faced with is the, the middle of the page there. You'll note, notice that if you look at national vaccination rates, that dark blue line, You'll see how they've dropped off from a seven-day moving average of 211,000 vaccinations a day to 109,000 uh, vaccinations a day on a seven-day moving average basis. That's a 48% decline in uh, vaccination uh, rates over the last 
uh, for four weeks or so. The light blue line is discovery vaccination rates. You'll notice that the discovery line uh, precedes the, the national line a little bit. Uh, uh, yeah, so usually it runs about a, a week to two in advance of the, the national line. We see an exceptional uptake across the, the, the discovery base, but that too has now begun to, to plateau. Um, on the right hand side of the page, you'll see that if we we'll continue at the current cadence, we'll get to about 51, 52% of South Africa's adult population vaccinated. That's well short of the 60% target that I spoke about on the, the previous page. So, um, and unfortunately, it, it's not a, a linear, linear effect. It's, a, it's an exponential effect. Yeah, the further below we are, the further below 60% we are, the greater the chance we're gonna have a, a more severe fourth wave. Next page. The Discovery's experience so far, is, as I mentioned, has been good. So 1.9 million members out of the 3.5 million members currently uh, have, have been vaccinated. Uh, that's 2.5 million vaccinations delivered, bearing in mind that most members have received the Pfizer vaccine to date. Um, that's about 60.5% of uh, Discovery's adult population. We're running at a cadence of about 7,500 vaccinations a day. As you'll see in the middle chart there, the, um, yeah, the donut chart, uh, we're, we're very, very happy to report that we've had good vaccination uptake across high risk members, so elderly population, people with uh, various comorbidities. So 47% of our vaccinated population has been high risk, 3% medium risk and 4% uh, low risk. Yeah, so we're pleased with that as an outcome. Obviously we wanna up those rates as far as we can. On the right-hand side of the page, you'll see that uh, over 60s, we've got a vaccination uptake rate of uh, just short of 80%, 78.4%. 50s to 90s, 71%, uh, 35s to 49s, about 62%. And then it obviously a drop, drop, drops off from there. So we're, we're, we're pleased with this progress, but more work to be done and certainly doing everything possible to motivate members to get vaccinated. And I you know, would uh, you know, appreciate any assistance you could give us in this regard as well. And then um, next page. And then just to give you some sense on uh, the capability behind the scenes that uh, enables Discovery Health to do the sort of real world uh, uh, effectiveness study that we're going to present the results on today. Um, we obviously sit uh, firstly on the left hand side of the page, as you'll notice, we sit with a, a team of 25 actuaries across the Discovery Health uh, business. We've invested over you know, somewhere between 30 and 50,000 hours into uh, various you know, analytics in relation to, to COVID and uh, other topics. Uh, those actuaries then analyze various aspects of discovery health information and, and data. So I think uh, firstly, we've got a huge set of vitality data and wellness data, including activities and BMI. We've obviously got access to various aspects of claims data through the uh, various schemes that we administer. That allows us to do this longitudinal analysis of uh, member outcomes and as surely we'll present in the, the update section. We're able to compare vaccinated populations versus unvaccinated populations. We're able to track members all the way through from you know, vaccination to admission to ICU and then your know, death. We're able to see uh, PCR tests um, across those uh, various populations as well. We're able to then you know, compare those populations on a, a comorbidity basis, on an age basis, on a geographic basis. It's a very you know, powerful, powerful uh, data set. Um, and then you know, in the blue, buck blue bucket there, we've obviously had significant experience in delivering vaccinations as, as Discovery. So the Discovery vaccination sites have now delivered just short of a million vaccinations uh, countrywide over the last uh, six months. And uh, we've gained lots of knowledge and experience to the delivery of those uh, vaccinations, most particularly in relation to uh, side effects and yeah, adverse events. I'm delighted to let you know that on that front, we've had, uh, and touch wood, not a single severe adverse event across the Discovery vaccination sites to date. I'm very, very, very pleased with that. We, we were watching that closely and fully geared up for any of those events at the start of it. Unfortunately, our paramedics and our doctors of the vaccination sites have been you know, the quietest people in the vaccination sites. So with that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Shirley. Um, as, as Nolly mentioned, she's the head health actuary. She's led this uh, uh, piece of uh, an, uh, analysis alongside our team of actuaries at Discovery Health. Also important to mention is that Shirley works closely with uh, Glenda Gray and the Sasonke team and has you know, been part of the initial vaccine effectiveness studies at, uh, that uh, uh, Glenda Gray and team have run. So Shirley, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks, Ron. Um, let's, let's jump straight into the numbers. Um, 
Okay, so the, the period that we've analyzed and, and looked at is the start from the start date of South Africa's mass vaccination rollout, which was the 17th of May up until the 23rd of September this year. Um, Ron did mention that we are looking at a, a very big population base for our study. So for our safety study, we're looking at 1.7 million individuals that have been included. Amongst, um, amongst the, the 1.7 million lives, 1.2 million individuals that have been um, vaccinated with Pfizer, um, the remainder being individuals who have tested positive for COVID-19. And um, we compared the outcomes that our vaccinated population have had in terms of adverse events relative to the population that has contracted COVID-19. And then for our vaccine effectiveness study, we've um, applied a test negative design. What a test negative design does is analyze pathology results um, to obtain a vaccine effectiveness estimate. This is a method that's commonly used um, for assessing the annual effectiveness of the influenza vaccine. And for this study, we analyzed just over half a million COVID-19 PCR test results. Um, which were associated with um, just over 200,000 um, infections and four, just 14,600 consequent hospital admissions and just under 3,500 deaths. So a very large data set that we're analyzing there. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, in summary, really what we see here are just excellent effectiveness numbers across um, all endpoints. So if we look at confirmed infection, those that have been fully vaccinated, and by fully vaccinated, we um, mean 14 days post the second dose of, of Pfizer, we see a 79% reduction in the relative risk of, um, of uh, confirmed COVID-19 infection relative to the unvaccinated population. We see a 92% reduction in the relative risk of a COVID-19 admission relative to the unvaccinated, and a 94% reduction in the relative risk of a COVID-19 death relative to the unvaccinated. And some of you may be saying, okay, that's great. Um, you know, the vaccine works. Hasn't that been proven already? And um, it's really important that we analyze real world effectiveness data because the effectiveness estimates can differ to the estimates that are obtained from efficacy trials, from the randomized control studies, which are done under very tightly controlled conditions for a number of reasons. One, um, there can be different variants circulating. So the Delta variant um, was not circulating at the time of um, the Pfizer randomized control study. Um, secondly, real-world conditions, for example, adherence to the dosing schedule um, and um, distribution and cold, um, cold chain storage, et cetera, all of these things can actually end up influencing the ultimate vaccine effectiveness that um, we observe in, in the population. So good to see that um, we, we are observing excellent um, effectiveness. Okay, next slide. Okay, so what we have done is we've looked um, across the COVID-19 admission endpoint, and um, we, we're looking here for variation in vaccine effectiveness amongst a range of different sub cohorts. So what you see here is the vaccine effectiveness amongst males, and in each instance, the sub cohort is, is um, compared against the unvaccinated population. And in all instances, um, we've adjusted for age differences in the demographics, um, age, um, region, the surveillance week. Um, and what you can see is that males and females, um, there, there's just very little variation in, in the effectiveness. If we also look at the type of chronic condition that um, the member has, again, very little variation. Um, HIV does look like that does look like it has a higher VE estimate, but the confidence interval around that estimate is, is quite wide. We do have a smaller number of HIV members relative to um, other chronic conditions. And then also if we look across the provinces, um, really um, relatively very low variation across all provinces. 
So um, I think in summary, what we're seeing there is that we've got very high vaccine effectiveness estimates and um, very little variation across a range of these sub cohorts. Next slide. Okay, what we have here is um, the, the vaccine effectiveness amongst different age bands. And what you can see here is that there is a drop off in vaccine effectiveness for um, 80 years, for individuals 80 years and above. So the vaccine effectiveness drops by seven percentage points relative to individuals between the ages of 30 to 50, but still excellent protection for even the, the, the elderly. Um, and then also if we look across the, the number of chronic conditions and, and multi-morbidity profile of our membership base, we do also see a drop off in vaccine effectiveness for individuals with three or more chronic conditions relative to individuals with, with um, no or single chronic condition of about seven percentage points. But again, still excellent protection even for those with multi-morbidity and the elderly. Next slide, please. Okay, this is quite a busy slide. Um, and, and really what you've got here is um, information around effectiveness in time relative to the start date of um, vaccination date, um, all the way up to um, um, 99 days, which is the end point of our study. So what you're seeing is that um, firstly, for individuals who've had a first dose, that the vaccine effectiveness stabilizes um, post 21 days. Secondly, you see a big jump up in effectiveness after administration of the second dose. And if we look at um, vaccine effectiveness in month two and month three, the vaccine effectiveness is, is, is relatively stable between 80 and close to 80%. And this is vaccine effectiveness against infection. Um, when it comes to vaccine effectiveness against admission and death, um, even, even less variability in, in the picture um, towards the later time periods. And really why we've looked at infections first is that the literature is, is increasingly showing that um, vaccine effectiveness first wanes for infections, then subsequently admissions and, 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 and deaths is, is, seems to be the, the kind of last outcome to, to be impacted by waning effectiveness. So still in this period, um, we, we're not observing any waning um, effectiveness. Next slide. Okay, next slide. Okay, so what we've looked at here is individuals who've had prior infection and have then had a subsequent um, vaccination and, and been fully vaccinated. And um, what we see is firstly, um, the, the first picture we're looking at is individuals who have prior infection, and this, this isn't news, it's, it's, it's well documented in the literature, that prior infection does confer a level of protection against future um, in, in infection against COVID-19 and admission. And based on our latest data, we've seen that there is an 85% reduction in the relative risk of a subsequent COVID-19 admission for individuals who've had a prior infection. If individuals get vaccinated, so if those very same individuals get vaccinated and we compare them um, against individuals who, um, who are not vaccinated and, and have had prior infection, um, the, the, the relative risk reduces even further so individuals get a further 87% reduction and their relative risk of having a subsequent COVID-19 admission drops to 2% relative to the unvaccinated and those without prior infection. So we see increased protection afforded to individuals who had prior infection um, and, and there is most definitely a benefit um, to, to those individuals of, of, of getting vaccinated. Next slide. What we have here is the, the pattern of um, individuals um, getting reinfected over time. 
And really what um, we see here is that there is a risk of reinfection and subsequent admission and even death for individuals who've had prior infections. So prior infection um, does not confer complete immunity against um, the virus. And um, based on our data, we've had just over 11 and a half thousand members who tested positive for, for COVID-19 um, more than once, more than 90 days apart. We heard from Ron that's, that's approximately equal to 2.7% of our confirmed DH members. Um, you might be wondering why, why isn't that 15%? Because we said it was an 85% reduction. Those percentages are also dependent on the probability of coming into contact with the virus. Um, and then after 90 days, um, 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 we, we've observed uh, amongst this population uh, 37 unfortunate members who, who've actually tested positive three times. Next slide. Okay. Um, so what has been um, shown in, in, in the literature and also what we've seen in our own data is that the relative risk of reinfection for individuals who, who have had a prior infection has changed over the course of the pandemic. So individuals who had their initial infection in, in June and July of 2020, um, most likely affected by the um, ancestral variants of COVID-19, actually had in a 60-day follow-up period um, a 36% relative risk of, of, of reinfection. So their um, reduction in risk was reduced only by 65%. Whereas if we look at individuals who got infected in, who had their initial infection in, in December and January, um, December 2020 or January 2021, so most likely to, to have been infected with the beta variant, um, which was the, ma the main variant of concern circulating at the time in South Africa, actually subsequently had um, a 13.7% a, a relative risk of reinfection in the, in, in, in the 60 days following um, 90 days post their, their, their last recovery period. So there are much larger relative risk reductions. So we see much greater protection afforded to, to individuals from the beta variant, um, again, subsequent variants, than we saw for people affected with ancestral variants uh, against the beta variant. And, and really a, a fairly consistent picture for COVID-19 admission risk. Next slide. Okay, so this, this was really a fun piece of analysis for us, um, a huge data set we looked at, um, a, a, a really a very complex algorithm for us to have implemented and, and run. And really what we've looked at here is a clinical twin approach matching every individual who has received a vaccination against an unvaccinated counterpart in, in the discovery population and following up those individuals over time. Um, we've um, bootstrapped, which means we've um, repeated this process um, numerous times in order to get a confidence interval around our estimates. And really what I'm presenting to you now is the conditions that we've identified as adverse events following vaccination. We've looked at um, 179 conditions that um, could possibly be immune mediated. And of those 179 conditions, we have only found three conditions to have occurred um, at a statistically significant increased risk for the vaccinated population relative to the unvaccinated population. And those conditions are lymphadenopathy um, for Pfizer recipients, and, and that's only following dose one, and myositis for Johnson & Johnson recipients, and paresthesia for, for Johnson & Johnson um, recipients. Um, and then if, if we actually compare the rate of these adverse events for individuals who contracted COVID-19, relative to an uninfected population and, and following up those individuals also within 42 days, we see actually 
higher rates of these conditions amongst individuals who, who contract COVID-19. And that, um, next slide. Over here, we have the top adverse events from the 179 conditions that we've evaluated. 40 of the 179 adverse conditions we've evaluated actually came out statistically significant. Here, we've um, provided the top 10 conditions. And the, the top one coming up is pulmonary embolism for individuals who've gotten COVID-19 um, and, and, and followed by acute kidney injury and, and seizures and arrhythmias. And I think the important thing here is, is, is one of context. Um, we see the rate of these adverse events um, uh, amongst the vaccinated population, the, the increased excess risk of, of um, the, these events in the, in the population, actually being in the vaccinated population being completely insignificant. So these are excess events for the COVID-19 population and, and really the, the risks um, associated with COVID-19 of adverse events completely outweigh um, the, the, the risks following vaccination. Next slide. Thanks, and hand over to Ryan. Thank you, Shirley. I mean, uh, just amazing insights and your know, congratulations again on a superb uh, piece of analytics. Um, uh, we thought it might be useful just to summarize the key outputs from the slides that uh, Shirley's just uh, presented um, into sort of eight uh, you know, quick bullet points. I think yeah, the first thing to note from the slides is uh, relative to the vaccinated populations, unvaccinated members are five times uh, more likely to get COVID-19, five times more likely to get COVID-19 infection, and 20 times more likely to die as a result of uh, COVID. I think yeah, that is really the, the top line message for the uh, vaccination, the real world vaccination study. Um, I think yeah, the second thing worth noting is that we saw no vaccine related deaths uh, during the course of the, the study. And as I think you'll, you'll notice from the uh, adverse events slide, adverse events are actually very rare. I mean, when one thinks about lymphadenopathy, myositis and paresthesia, those really are minor uh, side effects uh, in relation to, to vaccination. So I hope this gives you some comfort around the safety of the, 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 the vaccines. I think uh, the third point to Shirley mentioned is that you know, we see a stabilization in vaccine effectiveness um, 28 days after dose one and 14 days after, after dose two. So those are maybe two metrics to have in mind, 28 days after dose one, 14 days after dose two. So a little variation in the vaccine effectiveness, as you saw across uh, six chronic conditions and province, uh, equally saw little variation across uh, many of the age categories other than people over the age of 80. So we did see a reduction in vaccine effectiveness in people over the age of 80, but even at that level, very high levels of vaccine effectiveness. Um, point six is uh, the point uh, that Shirley made around hybrid immunity. Well, we've, uh, within discovery, we've uh, begun to label this colloquially as super immunity. Um, uh, you know, I think it really points to the uh, point that while um, infection can give you some level of natural immune response and certainly seems to be a meaningful natural immune response, that immune response is really boosted uh, by vaccinating on top of that. So 98% effectiveness if you've had COVID before and then uh, been vaccinated on top of that. And that really uh, make, begins to make you uh, bulletproof or super immunity as we refer to it. And then you know, as far as we can see uh, across the three months, no indication of vaccine uh, uh, effectiveness waning. That being said, it is early stages and we will continue to track this data over time. I think this is yeah, a, a part, part A of probably a three or four part uh, study. So we'll track yeah, this database uh, going forward. I think, uh, as you'll know, we need to look at uh, waning vaccine effectiveness six months out and eight months out. Um, but uh, we're obviously not there yet in, in South Africa. We're close to being there. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll continue to track that and we'll likely report back to you on that uh, early next year. 
And then, as we've mentioned throughout, a very low uh, risk of severe adverse events. We know that the, the global literature talks to somewhere between one and two per million uh, doses of vaccine you know, delivered, and, and we certainly haven't seen uh, severe adverse events uh, you know, across across our, our database. So I hope you found that uh, useful and insightful. Um, it is a a rigorous uh, piece of analysis on a very, very big data set. I was joking with the team uh, last week. Um, we had to sh uh, uh, shut down access to some of our mainframes to run this uh, simulation for a, a period of time during the last two weeks. And I was blaming the team for the load shedding that we all experienced across South Africa, just to give you a sense of you know, how big this analysis has actually uh, been. So thank you once again, Shirley. Uh, Nalu, over to you. Thank you so much, Ron, and thank you so much, uh, Shelly. Uh, it's good that you've given us enough time to have a, our Q&A. So I'm going to go through quite a few of these questions uh, very quickly um, and, and allow you to answer. So the first question was around a vaccinated versus unvaccinated uh, individuals who are asymptomatic. Um, what is the difference in terms of transmiss transmissibility of the infection? So these are asymptomatic people, both uh, the one is vaccinated, one is unvaccinated. And I think this one really talks to, um, you know, the data that we have uh, seen uh, published already around, I think early on, we thought if you were vaccinated, you were less likely to transmit the infection until Delta hit us. And uh, there was that uh, study that was done uh, by CDC that showed that the viral loads uh, you know, between these two uh, groups were similar. That's why they re recommended the reintroduction of masks to people who are vaccinated. So I think the transmissibility is still um, an important discussion. And I think more data is still being collected in this space. But I think right now we say that because the viral loads are almost uh, similar, the risk of transmission still uh, exists even for the vaccinated. But I think we we'll qualify that by saying because the breakthrough infections are really rare uh, in people who are vaccinated, so the likelihood of them being spreaders of the infection is therefore much lower than if they are unvaccinated. So I don't know if there's anything else that you'd like to add to that. So I think that answers that question. Ron, if we have so much vaccine, <laughs> why are doctors not being given Pfizer boosters? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. I mean, Nolly, you should weigh in on this one. I know you've been spending a lot of time with Linda Gray as a, as a Shirley on this, and yeah, we've certainly been asking this question of the Sasonke team on behalf of our our members and healthcare healthcare providers. I think yeah, the reality is that uh, the clinical research and data does not exist for a, a Pfizer following a J and J vaccine. So there is research available on a Pfizer following an AstraZeneca. A dose out of the the UK, but we don't have clinical research on a um, Pfizer following a J and J, uh, and I think yeah, that's left the uh, vaccine ministerial advisory committee and uh, the various vaccinologists and immunologists across the country are yeah, uncomfortable in making a, a population based uh, decision where there isn't uh, really research uh, available. So I think yeah, that is the the top line uh, reason for that. That being said, yeah, I think you all know it is a a very big debate that is uh, happening. Um, and there is certainly consideration across the, the various structures, including the Vaccine Ministerial Advisory Committee, the National Department of Health, uh, uh, Glenn de Grey and the South African Med Medical Research Council are weighing in on this debate. And I think uh, what we've heard is that uh, watch the space over the, 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 the coming months. Um, and uh, as we've seen with all of the vaccine decisions, I'm confident that they'll make the, the right decision on this. But yeah. unfortunately, no research to base a population decision on at this stage. Yeah, and I think there are issues of liability there if, uh, you know, if you, if you start, uh, you know, uh, recommending that. And we are aware, obviously, of the FDA uh, positioning on, on some of these issues in terms of mixing and matching. But I think the other big piece, I mean, uh, for, for, for some of the, of the commentary that's out there around this is that, um, you know, there, there have been some small studies where they showed, I mean, they just, they measured antibody response for following a mRNA administration in people who have a received, a, you know, the first dose of, of JNJ. And what uh, is still unclear, because I think some of the commentaries around superiority now of, of the boosters, and, and, and I think jury is still out there in terms of 
which a uh, booster is is superior and i think it's very difficult to to say that in the absence of uh, you know good uh, studies that show that you know you can actually have a sustained robust immune response uh, and compared between the the various vaccines so i think this is a, a an area where we will be watching the space and i think we'll be guided by science and uh, we do understand the anxiety out there, but I think we do have an option with the j, &J vaccine that has been tested and shown to be um, you know, effective. The other question, Ron, is around when do we anticipate that uh, you know, the under 12s will be um, you know, you know, prioritized then for, for, for vaccinations? Yeah, thanks, Nadia. This is a question I'm, I'm passionate about. You know, you know that well, I think um, I have a strong feeling that yeah, we need to be vaccinating all cross sections of the population. We know that in other countries, uh, kids uh, spread uh, infection. And we've certainly seen across the UK and Israel that outbreaks across kids are spreading to communities. And there's no doubt this is happening in South Africa. Um, I, I think yeah, the, the first thing we're worth mentioning here is we have a range of booster doses to get through first. So healthcare workers is a priority immunocompromised populations next. I think we'll then move through the different uh, age categories, most notably people over the age of 50. So I think we've got to prioritize based on morbidity and mortality. Um, there's also some uh, discussion around a second dose for kids between the ages of 12 and 17. And I think uh, we know that the data says kids between the age, if you want to uh, reduce transmissibility between in kids between the ages of 12 to 70, they ideally need uh, two doses rather than, than one dose. So when you stack that up, um, there's quite a lot of ground to cover before we get to uh, um, the, the 5 to 12 or the 5 to 11 population. That being said, we know that uh, the FDA has approved uh, the vaccinations for 5 to 11 year old. They rolled out in the US, I think, during the course of uh, last week. I've read the Pfizer documentation uh, submitted to the FDA. The evidence is astounding. I mean, it just is spectacular on 5 to 11s, both from an effectiveness point of view as well as from a safety point of view. The only thing, the only complexity on the 5 to 11 vaccinations is that they've taken, they've reduced the, the dose to a 10 microgram dose as opposed to a 30 microgram uh, dose. So that does raise some complexity in terms of procurement. So you actually have, will have to procure different uh, vials of vaccines. So they've got a 10 dose vial as opposed to a six dose vial. So uh, a little bit of ground to cover. I'm hopeful that uh, during the first half of next year that we will see uh, vaccination um, or the yeah, five, to, five to 11 year olds yeah, eligible for vaccination now. Thank you so much, Ron. I think now I'm bringing you uh, in, Shelley. I think this question from Andy is really around the numbers, and I'm, I'm, I don't think it's specific to vaccine effectiveness because I think vaccine effectiveness was very clear that it was for, for the Pfizer uh, vaccine. So the, um, the, 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 the question is around whether these numbers include healthcare workers who are discovery members who were vaccinated under Sisonke. So when we report on discovery data, does it include the Sisonke data? Yeah, um, so, so the VE estimates are just for Pfizer um, that, that we provided uh, now, um, and then the safety analysis that we've looked at is, is, is across all vaccine types. Um, for for um, the, the, the VE estimates, um, we are working with the Sison Care Research Investigators. We've put together a manuscript, also combining data from, from other provinces and, and um, the provinces as, as well. So. Um, the, the final VE estimates would differ from, from what we see from the discovery data alone. Um, and, and hopefully those, those figures will be available to the public soon. Okay, maybe a question for you, Ron. Are discovery sites involved in administering booster doses of J&J? Yeah, great, great question. I didn't actually see that one in the chat. Thank you for picking that up, Nadu. So uh, yes, we are part of the uh, Sasonke 2 rollout. Um, so there is a limited number of sites that are accredited across Discovery. So one Discovery place in Santon, uh, the Cape Town Convention Center in Cape Town, um, and then our Virgin Active Pavilion site in uh, KZN, our Sasonke 2 accredited uh, sites. Uh, we did receive stock uh, yesterday uh, for, for j and I think yeah, the important point to make is you need to wait for your second SMS. Uh, so lots of people uh, coming in on the first SMS. The second SMS has got a consent form. The consent form is critical for the Sasonke study. We can't vaccinate without that uh, 
uh, a second SMS. So as soon as you've got that, so some has promised to get those out over the course of the next week to two weeks. Um, as soon as you've got that, then you know, book a spot at a discovery vaccination site or, or one of the other accredited sites uh, to get uh, your, your booster dose. This is an important, thing. so much, Ron. This is another important, important question. So this is someone who was vaccinated with J&J &J in Feb. And then after that, they took two Pfizer vaccines in July and September. And now they've received communication to go for a booster J&J. &J. And so, <laughs> and then they're asking if they should take the J&J booster as requested by Susanga. I think Susanga sent that message in error uh, because maybe you, you know they don't have records of you as, as having received the Pfizer vaccine. I think the communication is very clear that if you've received, a, a, in fact, it says unauthorized doses of, <laughs> of Pfizer uh, boosting, uh, you would not qualify for the Susanga boost. Um, uh, so now, uh, then they're asking, uh, are we able to do any study with regards to reinfection rates in our data range of post-Delta version of COVID-19 with good IgG antibodies versus post-first and second Pfizer and J&J immunization? So I think that one you can take, uh, Charles. Yeah, um, so we haven't looked at the, the, the kind of IgG data yet from our pathology results data. Um, but what um, we, we, we can conclude from the data is that the relative risk of, of reinfection for individuals with prior infection is, is, is tracking at about 0 0.15. So, so about a, a, a sorry, that's not of admission of, of infection, it's, it's, it's COVID-19 admission. Um, whereas for Pfizer, you're seeing um, um, uh, an odds of post being fully vaccinated of about 8%, so 92% so effectiveness. So actually what we are seeing from the data, um, we, we can infer that um, being fully vaccinated with Pfizer affords greater protection than, than prior infection. I think just staying with the reinfected, uh, there's a question that says, are there commonalities in the profile of the reinfected patients? Yeah, think, you'll, you'll, yeah you'll remember we looked at this earlier yes. in the pandemic. Um, yes. we, we, we haven't looked at it recently. There were some interesting things we saw in the data. Definitely, um, definitely. I, I mean, I mean one, one condition that came up as, as statistically significant was bipolar mood disorder. Um, which um, we, we couldn't um, immediately explain. Um, uh, the other one that came up was, was chronic renal failure. And there's a question mark around, you know, if it's, um, if it's because of underlying immunity issues or if it's just a fact that these were individuals who are more exposed because they were they're interacting with the healthcare system. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have a, a causative clinical view yet of, of, of what causes reinfection or, or, or which individuals are most likely to, to get reinfected, but it's certainly an area where we'll look um, into in, in more detail in the data. I think what was quite interesting in the data shells was that uh, with the chronic renal failure patients, most of them had multiple comorbidities, so, mm -hmm. and most of them were on renal, renal dialysis, so it does talk to 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 you know some some significant degree of immunosuppression because of the underlying uh, chronic condition. So I think it's something that we are really uh, very keen to 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 investigate further. Um, and then there was a, an important question here around you know looking at how we adjusted uh, the, the the data. So they say. Ron showed most of the vaccine was administered in higher risk individuals with these relative risk reduction numbers corrected for the individual's underlying risk category or was it just extrapolated to low risk individuals? Um, it, 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 I mean, I'll, I'll jump to that. Um, it, it, it wasn't adjusted. So those are the, the actual effectiveness numbers um, based on the population that has received the vaccine. But where the adjustment takes place is against matching against the unvaccinated comparators. So when we're comparing 
individuals that are 60 years old, we're comparing them against other individuals who weren't vaccinated that are also 60 years old and have a similar comorbidity profile and are in the same region in the country. Um, so so these, these are the actual effectiveness numbers based on the population that has been vaccinated and reflects the demographics of the population that has been vaccinated. No. Julie, you might want to elaborate there. I thought your clinical twin and, um, analysis is, is a good way to explain that. Do you maybe want to speak yeah. about uh, the clinical twin? Yeah, sure. So um, certainly on, 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 on the safety side, what um, why we had to look at a, at a clinical twin approach is um, if we wanted to get a causative um, indication of, of what uh, um, of, of the vaccine contributing to an adverse event, we need controls. So typically you'll be familiar that, a, that um, a randomized control study is set up to create controls and um, one then can estimate the effect of, of treatment um, by observing the gap between the, the, the um, intervened group and the, the controls. Um, what we lack in the, in the data in these retrospective analyses are, are controls. We're not um, setting up a, a randomized control study up front and deciding who will get vaccinated and who will not get vaccinated. So we need to look to the data and see how can we get controls so that we can understand exactly what the impact is from vaccination relative to the unvaccinated. And when we do that and when we search for controls, it's very important for us to adjust for demographic and, and clinical factors that can influence the outcome. So we do know that COVID-19 admission risk and mortality is um, intertwined with, with um, age. Um, in other words, the older you are, the, the risk increases exponentially. Um, the, the more chronic conditions you have, the more likely you are to have a severe adverse event um, that being hospitalization or, or death. So those are factors that we um, look for in, in our population. And we make sure that every vaccinated individual that we are analyzing is matched against a control that is almost a clinical twin based on the data we have. And we follow up both groups over time in order to observe what the actual difference is between the vaccinated population and the unvaccinated population. And this is also one of the challenges that um, many safety, um, safety reporting systems have, such as those in the, in, in the States, they lack controls. So every people can report adverse events, but we know that the rates that the population also, um, the, these adverse events also occur in the population without vaccination. Um, so this is a this is a nice way to um, get a sense of um, safety events on on a, on a very large data set. Um, the randomized control studies just aren't sufficiently powered um, to give a, a causative um, assessment of whether or not the, the, the vaccines are actually causing those ad, um, adverse events. Thanks so much, Charles. I think there are some um, questions that relate to, I think people are excited about the Pfizer effectiveness data. Now they are asking, where is the J&J effectiveness data? When are we going to see that? And I think that then as you, as you respond to that question, there's an, an important one that says, have we seen any data comparing the effectiveness of J&J vaccine against Pfizer? And what do we know about the different vaccines in terms of how yeah. we yeah, so, so, so there has been some published literature already to date that is available in the public domain um, that, that um, has, has looked um, at, at those vaccines alongside each other. Um, so, so that is available. Um, and there have been um, and some uh, a study that I think is, is available in a, in a preprint um, format um, based on, on J&J in, in, in the States. Um, what I can say from our data is that we did observe much stronger effectiveness um, of, of the vaccine for admission and, and mortality endpoints than we did for infection. Um, so, so, and I think that is one that um, anecdotally I think everyone is aware of. Um, so, and, and that is also consistent with, with the literature published to date. 
Um, unfortunately, I can't give a, a, a publication date of, of, of when those Hasonke vaccine effectiveness estimates will be um, available. It is all um, dependent on, a, on an external review process. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Shells. And I think, I mean, there is definitely literature out there, you know, looking at the, and, and I think the, the big issue is really around the fact that the, the vaccines do work differently. Um, and, and, and the J&J vaccine has been shown to not mount as great an immune response from an antibody point of view when you compare it with Pfizer. But in terms of long-term immunity, in terms of your T cells and, and stuff, it, it has been shown to actually really um, have a good sustained um, you know, a protection, which is important for severe illness and, and death. So I think we should, uh, we should be looking out uh, for that. Uh, does that mean that uh, we should hold off on getting second dose of J of J, &J until closer to the fourth wave, Ron? <laughs> um, I think the question is: Should people be waiting for the Pfizer, uh, you know, uh, dose? Uh, I mean, the Pfizer booster, um, or should people uh, really take the opportunity to go and get uh, vaccinated with the J and J booster? Yeah, I think yeah, the important thing to note is that um, last year's second wave started to manifest towards the end of October last year. And obviously, it looks like we're still quite low from an infection level and from an, a reproductive factor level. But be aware that it starts bubbling up way before these waves start. Um, yeah, so in my view, I would aim to get uh, a booster dose sooner rather than uh, later. Uh, yeah, I think it's unlikely that we're going to see Pfizer boosters uh, during the certainly during the course of November, probably unlikely during the, the course of December, uh, depending on how things un unfold. And I certainly wouldn't want to take the risk in waiting till uh, January or February, given our projections on a, on a fourth wave. I mean, I think we do know that the J&J the vaccine is effective. We know that the J&J vaccine is safe. Many uh, scientists in the, the US in particular are saying J&J you know, should be a two-dose vaccine in, in any event. Yeah. So I would in, encourage you. I'm certainly I'm a J&J recipient as well. I'm going for a J&J booster as soon as I get that, uh, that consent. Yeah. No, thank you so much, Aaron. I mean, I don't know, Shells, in our effectiveness data, if there was a specific you know, a focus on pregnancy, pregnant women uh, who have received Pfizer and how the vaccine actually um, fed in, in, in them? We haven't looked at, at, at pregnant women um, yet, but it's certainly an area we can look at. Okay, thanks. So there, there's a question around when can one get, a, you know, their dose uh, if they've had an infection already. So we know that you wait at least 30 days uh, after recovery before you can get your dose. I think this one is an important one because it speaks to, um, you know, the hybrid immunity that we were talking about. So if a person has had COVID, can they just get a single dose and not bother about uh, completing their dosing schedule, specifically when we're thinking about Pfizer? I don't know, Ron, if you want to take that one. <laughs> it's, it's a, yeah, it has come yeah. up more than once. Yeah, this is a, it's an interesting debate. Uh, Nola will tell you uh, it's a debate here we've been having over the course of the, the last year, few, few weeks. I mean, I think as you've seen from Shirley's data, that if you've had a prior infection and then a vaccination on top of that, it really gives you the su super immunity, as we call it, a hybrid, hybrid immunity in scientific circles. So it almost, I think, uh, like the way Nola has framed it previously, is that infection is kind of your, your booster, if you, if you will. Um, that being said, we know that there's no harm in having that uh, second dose uh, J and J, and I think uh, you know, given the the safety profile of these uh, vaccines, so long as you haven't had a severe adverse effect, reaction to the first dose, I would encourage you to you know, get that uh, that second dose as well. Um, there's certainly no no doubt no downside to to that you know, on a relative risk basis. Thank you so much. Uh, we've had a very interesting discussion. Thank you. To everyone who has posted their questions, we really appreciate uh, you engaging us on this data. Maybe as a closing, Ron, uh, when the Pfizer boosters are current, uh, you know, are finally approved, will these be offered uh, by to, to Discovery Health members uh, who have previously received J and J? And I think I, I, the answer would be guided by science and guided by obviously whatever the rollout uh, plan is. Uh, I don't know. 
Yeah, I think I'm even more bullish on that. I think uh, the data and the evidence globally is so uh, conclusive and so unequivocal across the globe. We're very, very confident in the effectiveness of the vaccines. We've seen the effect across uh, not only Discovery Health populations, but also our life uh, business, uh, Discovery Life Insurance business uh, populations. Um, and you'll see in our Discovery Life business, we're actually offering uh, premium paybacks for uh, people who sign up who are now fully fully vaccinated. That's how confident we are in the effectiveness of these uh, these vaccines. So, uh, yeah, uh, as boosters roll around, um, I think it's uh, we'll certainly be confident in you know, funding decisions around uh, boosters. You're know, backed by you know, the sciences that emerges over time. I'm you know, certainly you know, happy happy to support. It's a good it's a good investment both from a clinical perspective but also from an economic perspective in South Africa. Thank you so, so much, Ron. Thank you so much, Charles. It was really a meaningful discussion. Hopefully people really found uh, the, the insights very encouraging and very important, even for sharing with their, with their patients. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Have a good night. Please remember to uh, give us your feedback on the poll. Thank you and good night.